I'd like to speak about navigation and um, some of the reasons that you might move in a survival situation is because you're lacking resources. Water is an example that we're lacking on the land that we've been staying on and so I'm interested in us finding water. But I also want to back all the way up to the beginning of navigation. I think that for many people it can be a very intimidating topic because in order to practice it you think that you have to kind of get lost in the middle of the backcountry and having uh, not much experience this seems very stupid, which it is. So I think that the easiest way to learn how to navigate is to start with as many tools as possible around you. In fact, go ahead and start on a marked road in your car with a GPS and an odometer and then go ahead and have your USGS topographic maps out with you and that way you're never going to actually be lost um, because you can always backtrack on that road with your car full of gas and everything uh, but you can concentrate on looking for features and starting to understand how to read the land. After you've done this in a car, I would suggest going on a marked trail. And this way you can walk as you're learning how to navigate using your compass, your map, looking for features, having expectations about what should be coming up, turning around and looking behind you to see what it looks like from the other direction. But once again, you're sort of in a safe environment to do so because you're on a trail. So you're not going to get lost. If all else fails, just turn around and walk back the way you came from. And then after that, go ahead and do some route finding. Get off trail, go into the backcountry a little bit more, shoot for features, try and retrace your steps, and so on and so forth. So um, I'd like to take this opportunity to teach what it's like to navigate from a car. We've stopped where there's a highway right behind us, and then sort of a four-wheel drive backcountry road uh, that is perpendicular. Um, also, this road is labeled. 103. So I should be able to find it on my map, which is a great thing. And um, the next thing we're going to do is actually talk about topographic maps and how to read them. And then we'll go ahead and take a drive and look at some features and see if we can make everything that we're seeing match up with what, we sh what the map says. I have my topographic maps laid out and they are correctly oriented. I've used my compass to make sure of it and we'll discuss how I did that in a moment. Topographic maps are unique because they tell you the elevation of a mountain. They tell you the depth of an ocean. And they also tell you the slope, whether things are steep or more gradual or even flat. And so we are able to get an understanding in two dimensions of what is really happening in 3D in real life. When we look at a topographic map, the first thing we want to know is what map we're on. In the lower right hand corner of your maps, it will tell you the name of the map. This one, named right here, it will also tell you the year that the map has been basically updated at or where it's the last time that some satellite came over and uh, confirmed the features of this area. Then there's some more highway and road information that you can read and get acquainted with. In the middle we have the state that we're in and then there's a dot right here telling us where exactly we are within that state. Below we have ourselves, this is the map that we're on, and then every map name that surrounds us. So, seeing as I have the map to the west, which is number four, if I read this it says Monticello Lake. And of course, this one reads Monticello Lake. Other information that's very important is the scale. This one reads 1 to 24,000, and that can be in any unit of measurement. So it could be 1 inch in real life, or I'm sorry, on this map is equivalent to 24,000 inches in real life. 1 foot to 24,000 feet, 1 mile to 24,000 miles, so on and so forth. Below this we have a scale. Uh, there's a scale in miles. There's 1 mile, 
and then another mile, so this is two miles. We also have uh, in meters, we have the metric system below. The next important piece of information is the contour interval. This is the interval in between the contour lines, which are all of the brown lines on the map. Now this is a little bit tricky with these two maps. This one reads a contour interval of 10 feet, whereas this one reads a contour interval of 40 feet. When you have small contour intervals like this, it means that the land is relatively flat. And in order to make uh, features become distinguishing, you have to keep that interval small. This one, there obviously is more of a range. There's more height and depth to the land that's off to the west. And so they were able to make the map in 40 foot contour intervals. So every brown line is either increasing or decreasing in elevation by 40 feet. So when I'm looking at these, I see that there's lots of brown lines on this one and sort of the same amount on this one. However, we now understand that every brown line is only 10 feet. So this is still a very flat area in comparison to this area. So now we go ahead and look at our maps. Now, there is a lot of other information on this map, which I'm skipping over because we're just going over the basics today. First of all, we look at colors. I see white, I see green, I see blue, and then I see red, and I also see black. Let's begin with white. In general, anything that's white on your map means that there is an absence of overhead vegetation. So there may be vegetation on the ground, but it is not overhead. The hope is that in these areas, if a plane were to fly overhead, it would still be able to see you because the vegetation is not overhead. Whereas with the color of green, we have overhead vegetation. So if we're in a dark green area, most likely we won't be able to see, be seen by something flying above. Now on this map, there are also speckled areas areas that are white and green and what that means specifically in this area is that it's shrubland and most likely sagebrush and rabbit brush in this area so we have our absence of overhead vegetation in white our overhead vegetation in green and in the dotted area of green and white our sort of shrubland area the next color I'd like to focus on is blue. So, for example, we have a blue enclosed shape here. It's entitled Kelly Reservoir. It also has a dark blue line surrounding it versus some of these light blue lines that enter into it and are around it. Dark blue lines or thicker blue lines are perennial water sources, meaning that they're year round. Whereas thinner blue lines or lighter blue lines or dashed blue lines, depending upon your map, mean that these are seasonal water sources. And so if I had to choose where I was going because I needed to get to water, I would definitely, especially, especially in the arid southwest, uh, I would definitely go towards a solid blue line over a dashed or thin light blue line because I'm looking for a year-round source. I don't want to head towards something that may or may not exist. And in these dry areas out here, oftentimes these light blue lines on the map don't have water in them. They just show sign of water. Um, and oftentimes when it floods, they might fill up. Uh, we also have areas like right here that are dotted blue um, and that is once again some sort of a lake or reservoir but it is not year-round, it's not perennial, it's seasonal. The next color that we see on the map is the color black. Now, Black always indicates a man-made feature, a man-made title, um, or the peak of an elevation point. 
of all the colors on this map, it is the uh, one that you should trust the least because man-made features are likely to change faster than a mountain will crumble and the contour lines and the green and white colors will change. So you have to watch out. When we saw this road sign here, I see that it does mark up with this map. I've traveled down this road already and looked at some of the other roads that come off the side and some of the ones that are labeled have the wrong numbers or numbers that differ from what's on this map. So if I don't really know where I am and I just follow a man-made road or a man-made sign, I might get myself into trouble, which is why it's so important to know how to actually navigate and read a topo map. Can't trust man-made features um, too, too much, but they do give you some good information. Uh, I mentioned that red is, you know, roads and such, and so you see a lot of red on, on these maps. It also is giving um, squares that are for a different use of reading a map, which we're not going to go into today. Now, the most important color on this map is brown these contour lines, these lines that tell us all about the slope and the height and the depth of the land. When contour lines, like these brown lines here, are all contour lines, when they are far apart, it means that the slope of the land is very gradual, fairly flat, right? When they are really close together, it means that the land is much steeper. We are increasing, for example, on this map, every contour interval is 10 feet. In a very short area, we are increasing 10 feet very quickly, so it is steep. So when there is a lot of distance between our contour lines, it's fairly flat or the slope is very gradual. When they're really close together, it means that the land is fairly steep. And sometimes they'll even be on top of one another. And when contour lines converge, it means that you have a straight wall. Not something that you're gonna wanna go try and climb unless you have ropes and such and are a climber. But as far as taking a route, you are looking for where the contour lines are most separated. When we look at these contour lines, we have a thick brown line and a number of thin brown lines. The thick brown lines, so for example this brown line here that's thick, somewhere along it we will find its elevation. So this one reads 6,850 feet. If I count five contour lines I will get to yet another dark brown contour line. So there's 6850, one contour line, two contour lines, three, four, I've hit my fifth. And if I follow this line, I'm gonna get my next elevation point, which reads 6,800 feet. So I know that from here to here, I am decreasing in elevation. I've decreased by five feet. This is a 10 foot contour interval map. So we went 6,850, 6,840, 6,830, 20. And then when we get to our dark brown line again, we're at 6,800, right? I missed it. 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. And then we're at the zero for the 6,800. When you follow a contour interval line, everything on that line is of equal elevation. Okay? When you're route finding, you don't necessarily want to be going up and down and up and down. This is a huge waste of energy. So one thing that you want to do is learn how to follow a contour line sort of in the direction that you want to travel but staying at a fairly even elevation, if possible. Right? Sometimes you do just have to climb a peak to get to the top of it, but staying at that equal elevation so that you're not um, overexpending energy that you don't need to, to use. When I look at this map, the other thing that I see are enclosed brown circles. So, 
For example, right here. I can see that this dark brown contour line is enclosed. That means I've come to a peak. It's the highest point. Another example is right here. I actually have a series of peaks. I have one peak right here, an enclosed circle, and another peak right here, another enclosed circle. Um, if I wanted to, for some reason, pass this direction, I would certainly want to travel in between the two peaks, right? So there's the peak, we're going to take the low route, and then there's another peak. Otherwise, I would climb up this peak and then go that way. What a waste of energy. Why not go in between the two peaks, right? I'm going to talk about the compass for a moment, and then we're going to get back to reading contour lines to understand their shape.